to get this open house started. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on a Sunday morning. We are excited to see all of you. Um, this opportunity is for you to get to know us, but also for us to get to know you. Um, so we will ask that you open your cameras um, so we can see all of you and um, have more of a community feel. We love to see who's on our calls. Um, it's a nice opportunity for everyone to sort of start building a community and a relationship. Um, we are going to hear from a few speakers um, and then we will open it for questions and answers um, from all of you. We really want to make sure that we answer your questions and that you get the information you need. Um, so if you want to pop them in the chat, it's open. If you want to wait till the end, but we will have a nice time for questions and answers at the end of this. Um, we are going to start the way that we always start with the Defar Torah. Um, our head of school, Rabbi Dr. Yossi Kassan, will take it away. Happy Sunday, everybody. Thank you so much for spending a part of your Sunday with us. We're very excited to see you and meet you. And thank you for turning your cameras on so we can see your faces. Um, thank you, Ellie uh, Levine, for setting this up and to our entire team for being here today, including uh, two of our student speakers who are going to be speaking to you later on today. Um, I wanted to actually, um, I was looking at this upcoming week's Parsha, Parsha Toldot, uh, where it talks about uh, Toldot Yitzchak. Um, and there is a pasuk which is very famous, where uh, it talks about how the how Yitzchak um, how Yitzchak and Esav grow up. Uh, it says he Esav ishu de'atzaid, right? He was a man of the field. He was a hunter. Esav dead. Ve'yakov ishtam yosheva alim. And but but Yaakov was a wholesome and abiding in tents. And the very next pasuk is the one that often comes in the question. Ve'yehav Yitzchak et Esav kitzai befiv. Right? And Yitzchak loved Esav, and it says because he knew how to trap, because he was a hunter, and Rivka loved Yaakov. It doesn't say a reason why she loved Yaakov, it just says that she loved Yaakov. So this is a very um, strange pasuk, right, where it actually gives a reason of why Yitzchak loved Esav, and then just that Rivka loved Yaakov. Um, so there are Mepharshim that actually talk about um, the idea of did Yitzchak actually love Esav because of what he produced, because of what he brought to the table, 
uh, both figuratively and literally speaking. Um, whereas um, when, when it talks about Rivka's love for Yaakov, was that more unconditional? And I'm actually going to quote somebody who I quote very often, uh, but I'm purposely quoting him today also because I want to join together in continuing to spread uh, the, the, the Torah of Rabbi, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, um, who I know has impacted many of us and really a tremendous loss for our entire world, not just the Jewish world, but the world at large. And Rabbi Sachs actually talks about this um, in, a, in a very different vein than some of the Mepharshim, that the idea of adding um, that uh, Yitzchak loved Esav because he was a hunter, because he hunted, is actually not a condition for the love. It's actually the contrary, because Yitzchak himself understands the importance of unconditional love, and that the Pesukim actually tell us he was a hunter. He actually did not even receive, he received bracha for for wealth, where Yaakov's bracha was for children, was to continue the, 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 the legacy of Torah, right? But Esav himself received a very different uh, bracha of wealth and to continue this, because what Yitzchak understood is that this is my child also, and I'm gonna love this child unconditionally, just the way my life, you know, just the way Rivka loves Yaakov, I'm gonna continue to love Esav. I understand that he's not a learner. I understand that he's, you know, that, that he has different strengths and different skills than what Yaakov has. But my love for him, even though he is a hunter, a man of the field, I'm going to love this boy unconditionally. And I think that is very apropos for what we're discussing today. I often say that if we were going to be fully honest with ourselves, we actually invest so much into our kids' education, into our kids' upbringing, uh, religiously and educationally, because if we were being honest, we want them to turn out exactly like us. <laughs> We want them to pray like us. We want them to sing like us. We want them to sing Zemira like us. We want them to uh, share the same day Torah. We want them to uh, observe like us. It's, it's, it's really deep down as parents, we want to give them what we have and we want them to take as much of it as possible. But what we also know is that children are all very different. I have four children of my own and each of them are incredibly different and love them all unconditionally for everything that each one brings to the table. And the important message that Rabbi Sachs gives us is this, that we know that as children grow up, when they're children, right, those are their formative years, and we try to give them as, as much of the skills and much of the understanding as possible. And then they get into middle school, and they start to, start, start to articulate their own opinions. And by the time they reach high school, that's when they're really starting to come into their own as a person. They're actually starting to understand who they are and what their contributions are going to be to the world at large after graduation, right? and what they want to do, what they're interested in, what they want to contribute. This, so these are the years where they are really starting to become that person on, on their own. And I think what you're going to hear today, not I think, I know what you're going to hear today from our upper school team, is the unconditional love and support that we give every single student, right? Yes, we can talk to you about how our, how our kids do academically and where they go to free universities afterwards and where they go free yeshivas and things like that. And that's all important. But what's most important is what you're going to hear between the lines in terms of the student autonomy, in terms of the level of choice that they have, in terms of the person they want to be and the things that they're interested in learning, in terms of the club that they're interested in participating in, in terms of what we give them as a, an entire support system for their whole person so they can actually become the person that they're destined to become. And so that we can set them up with the skills and the proclivities and the interest to, to contribute to the world after graduation in their own way. So I know that we all love our kids unconditionally and here too at Berman, we support all of our kids unconditionally, irrespective of what their interests are academically or otherwise. And we set up an entire system that really supports them in those ways. So without further ado, I'd love for you to hear all about that. I'm going to turn it over to our incredible upper school principal to, to get us. Oh, wait, I'm not turning it over. I'm actually going to tell you first, our, I'm going to talk about some of the core values, and then I'll turn it over. I apologize for that. Thank you for putting that up. Next slide, please. So first, I want to tell you generally about our school. Our school at Berman, we have core values, and we have categorized these core values into these three categories of academic excellence religious commitment and character development. And again, you're gonna hear about each of these in terms of the way that we support the whole student into becoming the person that they are. But first, academic excellence, right? And we talk about a core value of chachma, of wisdom. We all know that wisdom is not just knowledge, it's actually knowledge that is applied. 
So when we talk about excellence, what excellence actually looks like for a student, we don't just talk about straight A's in a report card because we all know that is not the that, that is not a, a, a mark of excellence. That is a data point. But what we really talk about is developing and measuring what our students can do with what they know. How do they apply our learning to the world around us? Are they, are they using their own creativity and curiosity? And also, as importantly, are they expressing their own understanding? Right? This is not just about us telling them, here's the content. And here's what I want you to think about the content. Here's what I want you to spit back at me on, you know, on an, on an exam about the content. It's also, what does this mean to you? I want you, I want you to bring your whole self. I want you to bring your own experiences, your own background to the table and tell me how you're reading this piece of content. What does it actually mean for you? All right? So when we talk about excellence, again, we talk about the, the entire person and the student. Next, thank you, is the religious commitment. Students that are, what we try to develop is students that are prepared to continue a life of Torah, Halacha, and Sionut. So another two of our core values that you'll see in here is Torah and Israel that we talk about. And when we talk about religious commitment, what we really mean is, first and foremost, we want students to be, to, to go through our upper school and to graduate onto the world with a sense of religious purpose, to understand that it's not just about learning content. Again, it's about the purpose and the relevance of that learning and how that Torah learning actually is relevant to the world around me and how it should be applied to everyday situations and scenarios that I'm going to encounter. Now, purpose without the skills uh, is, is only half of it. So really skills is something that we, we really work hard at building and we know because we speak to the yeshivots and seminaries that, that our students graduate into, that our kids really do excel in the skills and we do a great job at that. So really learning how to learn how to dive in, how to actually open up a Siddur and read it with understanding, how to open up a Gemara and be able to lay in a piece of Gemara. And we also talk about routines and responsibilities. You know, we want students that are going to graduate onto the world when, when they talk about Torah, not just to think, oh, I took a class on this particular piece before, right? But we want them to understand that Torah and davening and religion is something that is a part of our everyday routines. It's a part of our everyday responsibilities. It's not just something we learn. It's not just a subject area. It's a way of life. Next. And finally, character development. We talk about Dara Heretz and Achrayut and our core values. We want to develop students that are prepared to contribute positively to the world around them. Because again, if we're just teaching them academics or if, we, or if we're just teaching them Torah, but there isn't that third, that, that third leg of the stool, right? To actually take them out into the world, this is as important as everything else. When we talk about the whole child and we talk about the person that we want them to become to go into the world, they also have to be great people, contribute positively to the world around them. And I have to tell you, when I go out and I, and for the last two years, pre-COVID, when I was able to travel to Israel for the last couple of years and actually meet with the heads of the Shivot and seminaries and actually talk to, to the leaders of those institutions, when I hear anecdotes and stories about our Berman graduates and the way that they contribute to the yeshiva and seminaries, no, seminaries, the way that they are the first to lend a hand when, when help is needed, the first, uh, you know, when the Berman students are the first to stay back and clean up after an event, or they're the first to put an arm around somebody and bring them in when they're socially not, not integrating, or when they're the first to call a teacher or a Rebbe before Shabbat and, 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 and the Chag and say Shabbat Shalom and Chag Sameach to a Rebbe or a teacher. That's what we love to hear about because they're good people who are looking for ways to contribute and contribute positively. So this is what we stand for in terms of the academic excellence, but we how we define academic excellence beyond a transcript, right? About its academic excellence about the person. What does that actually mean? Mrs. Popper will talk more about that in a few moments. And what does the religious commitment actually look like? What do we want them to be able to have? What, we, what, what do we want them to be able to understand and to do? And finally, what kind of people do we want them to become? All in all, wrapped in the idea that our support system in order to get every child to these core values is in the way that is supporting them for who they are in the way that Rabbi Sachs defines, which is irrespective of what their interests are, irrespective of what their proclivities are. We are there to support them, build a support system around them, and to love them and support them unconditionally. So this is Popper. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Malka Popper. I'm the upper school principal at Berman. Some of you I've already had the pleasure of meeting um, either over Zoom or last year in person. Um, and I'm so glad and grateful that you chose to spend a little bit of your Sunday with us um, with us today. I wanna spend a few minutes um, talking about how these core values manifest specifically in our upper school. 
What does it look like to have academic excellence in the upper school? What does it mean to be religiously committed? And finally, um, character development. How do we do that in an in a individualized but also systematic way? When we think about ac academic excellence, as Rabbi Kassan was talking about a few minutes ago, we often fall into the trap of looking at the numbers and at the data. And I wanna assure you that we have the numbers and we have the data. Our students excel in their ACTs and SATs. Our mean score on the ACT is 1344. We had over 90, 90 AP exams last year. And of those 90, of those 90 exams, 94% of our students um, scored three or above on, on the exams and they were able to earn credit in college. But when we think about academic excellence, it's actually much more than just than just the numbers and just the data. When we think about our upper school program, we wanna know, we wanna think about what does it mean to learn something? And what we know and what the research has shown us is that learning is actually solidified. When a student is introduced to the same ideas in different contexts, when they see the same themes applied in different, in different instances, and actually when they're able to take an abstract concept and make it meaningful and relevant to their individual lives. So what we do in our program is we take, we take different themes, we take different ideas, we take the learning goals and objectives, and we seek ways to actually apply it in a very personal and very meaningful way. I wanna give you two examples. Um, in our engineering class that we, in our engineering program that we have, we actually have year one and year two of our engineering program when we partner with the Center for Initiatives and Jewish Education side. And what happens in the engineering program, and they sit there and they learn for, for the first semester um, concepts, ideas. You can see the, the image on the screen. They're learning how to, how to build bots. They're learning how to use Arduinos, learning basic coding. They're learning all of these different, these different concepts and ideas. And then as we pivot into the spring, the students are asked to identify a problem in the world and build something that they can use to solve it. And last year, and they do it in small groups, last year we had a number of entries into this contest, into this competition. One example was they built a systems check for an airplane so that you can know when you're sitting in your seat if a lavatory is available. A real world problem that they built something to be able to address. But one of our groups actually won, in, won the competition in one of the categories when they were living, it was COVID times, they had just hit hard and everybody was quarantined and the idea of social interaction was being challenged. And a group of our students said, wait a minute, this is something that we teenagers are really suffering from. And so what they did is they built a socio, um, they built a website, a social en engineering network website that would allow teenagers to be able to, to connect emotionally and spiritually with one another. And they were able to take the learning concepts and the learning principles and actually make a difference and improve the lives of, for themselves, their friends, and for other teenagers in the world. I wanna give you an example from one of our Judaic studies classes. Last week, I was meeting with one of our Gemara teachers, one of our Talmud teachers, and he was telling me that they're in the, pro the middle of learning the unit on Talmud Torah, on the, the why and the how of learning Torah. What does it mean that we have a mitzvah, an obligation to learn Torah, and how does one fulfill that obligation? And he said that the assessment that he's asked of his students is to write three mission statements for schools according to the different opinions that they had studied, and after they've written the mission statements and so that they know what this three opinions had said, they had to actually take it, make a decision about where they themselves would want to go to school and where they would want to send their children. And what we saw happen in that assessment was that the students were given the opportunity to not just share back and demonstrate that they know what other people said, but actually make it personal and think about what kind of school would they want to go to? What does learning mean to them? And I think in both the engineering example, the, the engineering class example, and in this Gemara example, what we're able to see is that students are given the opportunities through the learning that happens, through the unit design and through the assessments to solidify the learning, to see it introduced in multiple venues, and also to make it very personal and very meaningful so that it sticks and that it's enduring. But it's not just left to the individual teachers who are incredible, passionate, and dedicated, 
who think about how to connect with their students in and out of the classroom. But we also have a, on, in our school systems and structures to, ins to ensure that this type of learning um, is pervasive throughout our program. And I wanna talk for a few minutes about both the schedule that's created and how our students relate to that schedule and have their and exercise their own vo voice and choice in creating the schedule. So if, over the past year, we've transitioned our upper school into a block schedule, where instead of having, is where, where classes meet for longer periods of time, even though it's less frequent. And the benefit of the block schedule, as we know, and as the research suggests, is that, the, is that students are able to not only learn an idea, but in the same, in the very same class, they're able to learn an idea and, and begin applying it. And so the depth of conversation, the types of activities, the ability to show what you've learned, and also the ability for the teachers to be able to assess the student's knowledge is able to be at a, a level um, that is different when you have shorter classes, even if they meet more, more frequently. And so what we've done is we've designed a schedule to allow for a depth of learning to take place. The way that our students engage in the conversation um, as a result allows them to be more interested more curious, but also more interesting because our students are exposed to different, to different ideas and different concepts that they see throughout the four years in the high school. And when we think about the actual options that we have for our students, we think about ninth and 10th grade as a unit and then 11th and 12th grade as a unit. And in ninth and 10th grade, the focus is on ensuring that our students have a very solid foundation, that they have a breadth and a depth of knowledge in core subjects and core curricula in order to be able to become more specialized as they transition from the, their first half of their high school career into the second half of their high school career. And then ideally afterwards when they go off to college and university. And so what happens is, we have um, we ha we have opportunities for our students in ninth and tenth grade to begin exercising voice and choice. We have different tracks that are offered in some of our disciplines, not in every single department. An example would be all of our students need to have a solid foundation of English language arts, and so there is no in ninth grade. Everybody receives the same the same core courses, whereas by the time they start getting into 10th grade, we introduce an honors track so that when they get into 11th grade and 12th grade, they have the AP option and the honors options available to them. Um, and the same thing in Hebrew language, the same thing in Judaic studies, where we begin introducing tracks so that we're able to, to have the students begin to find the balance in their schedule. I think the word that we that we try to highlight in, in creating individual schedules is balance. That not every student should be taking um, a, an honors in every single level. Rather, we wanna make sure that the student is able to find moments where they wanna really push and challenge themselves with the guidance and support of our administration and our teachers but also to ensure that they are able to be successful in all of their class and in all of their courses. In ninth in through 12th grade, students have electives where they're, that is for available to all of our students to choose. And they're able to choose from engineering and AP computer science, American sign language, sports, health and fitness, ceramics, digital photography, studio art, um, and we also have a Beit Midrash elective for students that want an extra hour a day sitting in the Beit Midrash learning with a teacher or learning the Chavruta. We want to make sure that our students have the opportunity for that specialization where they're able to find areas of interest and passion. And as they go into and matriculate into 11th and 12th grade, we introduced more advanced courses. This year we had a group of students, I, I see Dahlia's on this call, right? Where we had a group of students that were, that were interested in taking AP biology. And so we created a course for those students where they were able, we added a new course so that we can continue their passion uh, in biology by introducing the AP. And what happens, um, what happens when we're building schedules is that it, we, we do three things. And the idea is that we want students through the process of schedule creation to actually become more self-aware 
and be able to articulate what it is that they want to take and why they want to take it. And so what happens is in the early spring, we meet with the entire grade and we, we introduce them to the choices and the different courses that, that are available to them, where it's a requirement, everybody needs to take this and where there's opportunity for choice. We then invite them to individual, invite is like a nice word, we, we actually schedule it with them, where they meet individually with a member of our leadership team in the upper school, um, whether it's our college guidance counselor or our, or our guidance counselor, Ms. Cooper or myself, um, at, or a department chair, and they actually think about which which classes they want to take. We invite them to submit their requests, which actually includes not just what the class they want to take, but why they want to take it so that they can articulate what it is, wh why they're making this choice and why they're interested. And so they could say, I'm interested because I took, I took this level last year. I'm interested because I'm really genuinely, I really genuinely want to push myself in this area. We ask the teachers for feedback and we engage in follow-up conversations whenever necessary. And the process that we use for building schedules is one where we're able to customize it to each and every student. No two schedules are the same. And we're able to use it as an opportunity to get to know our students and for to provide feedback for our students and for our students to be able to articulate their own goals and their own hopes and dreams for their, for their education. To that end, we ensure that we have a we have we have a number of people that are on our team in order to help support our students, both in their academic in their academic success and also social emotionally. We have Ms. Cooper, who's our dean of students, who I'll more formally introduce in a minute. But we also have academic advisement in the form of we have a college we have a college guidance um, a director of college guidance, Ms. Alana Hoffman. We have Israel guidance. Um, we have Mr. John L. Hector, who will, you'll see a picture of all the people in a few minutes, who, who oversees our, our social emotional development and support. And what happens with each and every one of these people is that they're there to help our students along their journey, both in terms of schedule creation, but also just as they develop from ninth grade into the adults who graduate in 12th grade. And finally, I want to take a moment before I move on to our next pillar and talk to you a little bit about our educational support services. Um, sometimes internally we call it resource, if that's if that language is familiar to you. But what happens with our educational support services, and we have a director of the department and we have a, several teachers in the in the department, they work with students in in small groups um, and, and individually on a frequent basis in order to help them um, along their academic journey so that the learning is accessible to them. So our educational support services teachers, our ESS, our ESS teachers, they're there to, to help students, whether it's they need help with executive functioning and organization, going through all their Google classrooms and making a schedule. What do I need to do tonight? What do I do need to do this week? And what do I need to do over the next two weeks? They help students sometimes when they had a difficult, a difficult learning experience in class, sometimes they'll work with them on relearning the information, reviewing the class notes, even actually learning how to take notes um, in a supplemental way. We, they help us develop FEPs, which are which I like to think about as passports that we give to the teachers to help our teachers understand better how they can make the learning accessible to each and every one of our students. And through the support of our ESS team, our, all of our students receive um, the support and the learning that they that they need and that they deserve in order to be successful academically. So when we start from the beginning and we think about what makes us excellent, we know that we know we're excellent because we see the data, we know where our students are going, we have so many options that are available to them, both in terms of college and university, in yeshiva and seminary, whether they're going to the IDF or whether they're going to Bar Ilan or whether they're going to Yeshiva Hakotel or Midrash at Lindenbaum, whether they're going to Yale, whether they're going to Barnard, whether they're going to YU Honors or Michigan. Our students are, are have choices available to them, doors are open, and it's because of the incredible, incredible teachers that we have. It's because of the systems and the structures that we have in place and the support that we help our students along their journey. I'd like to take a minute and talk about the second pillar, which is religious commitment. And as Rabbi Kastan shared, our students and our school is passionately modern Orthodox. When we think about religious commitment, we know that it's not relegated to certain classes or certain moments, but rather it's something that's pervasive throughout everything we do. It's in the hallways, it's in the classes, it's in the curriculum, 
It's in the conversations, it's in the ways that we conduct, them, it, conduct ourselves. It's not just half of the day where we're in our Torah subjects and then the other half of the day we turn that part of our mind off and we move on to the other things. But rather it's, it's who we are and what we're all about. And we do it with pride, we do it with commitment and, I, and, I, and we do it with passion. When we think about science as an example, right? I love, I love this conversation I get to have frequently with our science department chair, right? Who says, wait a minute, science isn't separate from Torah and from learning, but rather the study of science informs who we are as Jews. And I think that that is a beautiful slogan to, to think about how, just like we we're talking about in the area of academic excellence, when you see themes introduced time and time and time again, it solidifies it and becomes who we are. We think about that in terms of our religious commitment as well. When we think about skills, when we think about routines, right, we begin and we end our day with tefillah, but really in a typical year, and this year is a little bit different because of our potting and because of COVID, but in a typical year, we think about tefillah as an opportunity for students to have options available to them. Whether it's the quiet minion or the kavana minion or the women's tefillah or the ruach minion, in each of those tefillah, different types of tefillah experiences, students with their faculty are able to come together and begin and not only mumble words, but actually think about how they want to book and their day begin and end through being able to choose the type of tefillah experiences, being able to explore the different types, and also being able to make it deeply personal. In our Judaic studies courses, and I love talking about that about this with our with our with our Judaic studies teachers, but truthfully, honestly, with all of our teachers, it's rooted in text study. But when we think about text study, and I want you to remember the example I gave about the about the sugya, the unit of, of learning Torah, it's not just about what the text says, right? That when you want to know what the text says, which says translate it. You want to know what the text means, which means summarize it or explain it. But there's this third step that we always talk about, which is what does the text mean to me? And it's in those moments, it's in those very moments where we're able to say, wait a minute, how does this idea relate to who I am, my hashkafa, my ideas, my values? How should it and how does it impact how I engage in the world that we live in and the people that we encounter inside of the walls of Berman, in our communities and well beyond? It's in those moments where we're able to see how the religious commitment, how the classes that are defined as our Torah studies classes actually impact and inform the world around us. Because it's not just within those bells, it's everything beyond that. And when we think about our religious commitment, it also has to do with our love of the land of Israel and our love of the Jewish people, Eretz Yisrael and Am Yisrael, Medina Yisrael. And we think about, um, we think about our Hebrew language program. It's, been an, it's an intentional decision by our school that every student is required to take Hebrew language because it's not just the language of our people, but it's, we want our students to feel like Israel is their homeland, that when they walk, the, when they walk in the streets, when they engage um, in conversation, we should all feel comfortable. And, and it, both in terms of the language, it's not just Dulpan, but our Hebrew language program also focuses on the culture as well. Every four years, we take our entire upper school to Israel um, so that our students are able to take the learning that they've done and actually see it in action, explore the places together with our upper school faculty um, and with, with all of the other students together. We have um, Yom Ha'atzma'ut program, which has become the hallmark of, of the community. We have over a thousand people that typically join us where they're able to come together and say, this is what it means to celebrate Medina Israel. We have programming throughout the year. We have a relationship with, uh, with this year, again, is a little bit different, but we have the Torah Mitzion Kolel. We have Bachurim and Benot Shiru to come. And it's not just about the cholent that they serve on Friday, but it's about the passion and the love and the connection that they bring every day to the halls of our, of our building and to the students, in our, the students at Berman. And it's because of these moments, it's because of we think about how our core values are rooted in religious commitment in Israel, and it's pervasive throughout everything we do. And that makes us special and unique, and we're so proud of that. 
In order to introduce our third pillar, I wanted to introduce for a moment Ms. Ms. Dita Cooper, um, who I work who I work closely all day, every day with. Um, and, uh, Ms. Cooper is our Dean of Students, and in her role as the Dean of Students, she not only focuses on on the, the systems and the structures, the academics, working with the teachers, developing units, but actually with each and every one of our students to make sure that they are being, that they are successful, that their needs are being served, and that the entire department of social, emotional, and guidance is there in order to ensure their, their growth. So I'd love to turn the screen over to Ms. Cooper um, to talk about our third pillar. Good morning, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here to see some familiar faces and to be able to talk about my favorite of the three pillars, which is character development. Um, as Rabbi Kassan was talking, I think even though we separate these three things into defined pillars, they're really intertwined. And character development and the way that we emphasize the growth of our students, not just as students and academics, but as real humans. Um, full-fledged people with, um, with values, with a sense of derech eretz, with a sense of the way they treat each other, with a sense of communal responsibility. That really bleeds into everything that we do at the school. But today I wanna to focus a little bit on um, our student life program and how we both individually and as a community focus on these things in more programmatic ways. So the first of those things is our advisory program. Our advisory program was developed with two main goals in mind. One, to foster a small sense of community within a large school, and two, to give each and every student a faculty point person who is somebody who can check in on their social emotional health on a regular basis to make sure that nobody is falling through the cracks. Everybody feels like there's always an adult that they can turn to, whether that's of course a member of our administration or our guidance team, but also a faculty member. So our advisory program meets every other week it's comprised of groups of about eight to 10 students. And each year there's a specific social emotional health focus. This year that focus is on mental health about specifically learning about mental health and the way that it impacts the lives of teens in an effort to really destigmatize mental health and increase a culture of kindness in our school. And it's a, ple a pleasure to kind of go on that journey with our students um, and see the real impact that learning about mental health has had on the way that they treat each other and the way that they treat others in the world around them. That's coupled, of course, with our guidance program. We spoke a little bit about our guidance counselor um, before, Mr. Janelle Hector, who provides one-on-one -on -one social emotional support and serves all of the students in our school. And that can come in the form of, you know, um, helping students with things that are going on inside, um, you know, their lives in the school and outside their lives in the school to give the message that we really care about them um, not just their grades or not just whatever clubs or arts or sports that they're doing, but really about who they are as people and how we can help them grow. That's coupled with our academic support. Um, Ms. Popper spoke a little bit earlier about our educational support services, um, but our ESS team also is always providing both a level of academic support that bleeds into social emotional support. So when we think about students developing executive functioning skills or overcoming um, a fear of a particular <laughs> academic discipline. That comes in tandem with giving students a sense of confidence, a sense of ownership of their work, a sense of autonomy and independence um, that really can't be bought, but is developed with a lot of love and a lot of care. That, um, of course, kind of goes in one camp. And then, of course, we bleed into some of the, also the fun things that go into our school that um, infuse our school environment with a sense of joy and community. That starts with clubs. Currently right now in the school, we have 29 club offerings, almost all of which are meeting in some capacity, even in our pandemic model. Um, and one particular club, which we're so excited that meets um, frequently is our Berman Buddies Club. We are blessed to have a very special partnership with Sulam, um, our program uh, that's housed within Berman that is servicing um, learners of differing abilities. And our Berman Buddies program pairs together Berman students and Sulam students to get slushies in a safe way, a distance way outside of school. Of course, you know, things a little bit different this year um, to check in with each other, to make sure that everybody feels that they are socially a part of the larger picture. Um, so that's one of the clubs that we're particularly proud of. But of course, we're proud of all of our, 
our arts clubs, our academic clubs, Model UN, Mock Trial, Model Congress, all of those things, our knitting club, you name it, it's there and there it's constantly growing. That also is paired with our student council. We have a vibrant, large and active student council, both comprised of what we call big council, which is our executive council with members and representatives from all grades, um, but also smaller group councils. And the way that councils function in our school is really to partner with us as the adults in the building, as administrators and as faculty to hear um, the voice of the students to ensure that students have a tangible impact on the type of programming that we do in the school, the types of opportunities that we develop for students. And we're constantly working with our student council to make those programs great and with students at the heart of that. We have a robust chesed program. And that is, um, that is both in the sense of that we have required chesed hours, excuse me, as part of our graduation requirements, and that um, goes for each and every grade. But I have to say, um, having worked in the school for about a year and a half now, um, even if we didn't have these chesed hours required, I don't think that we would really need them. Um, our students are at the forefront of providing and participating in chesed opportunities around local and global communities throughout the year. And that really has not changed, even though um, the pandemic has hit in big ways and small ways. Um, we are, have students constantly looking for opportunities to contribute positively to the world around to them. This past week, um, we actually have a competition between some of our grades for who can donate the most um, cans and use clothing to a local homeless shelter um, because students are really always trying to find a way to give. And we're so proud of the work that they do and the chesed that they do in our community. And finally, we have two robust arts and athletics programs that span multiple clubs and multiple divisions and manifest themselves throughout the school. In a typical year, we have the Hadass play, um, which brings in so many students, so many different passions with acting and stage design and direction um, into our auditorium. And it's an amazing event that happens each year. That of course is coupled with all of the arts offerings and the electives that we already offer in the upper school. Um, which really gives students who are interested in the arts multiple venues to explore their passions. And that we, of course, also have a great athletics program. You can see a picture of our varsity girls team here. Um, we have athletics clubs and athletic teams um, offered for boys and for girls throughout the school year. Um, there are opportunities, of course, to play the sports that the students love, but also to foster a sense of leadership, of teamwork, of camaraderie, and those sporting events are really exciting times for our community to come together to support our kids and cheer them on um, and really uh, celebrate the the menschlichkeit, the, um, the niceness with which they teach, reach, teach each other and the way they treat um, other students that come into our school. So I don't do this alone, so certainly not. I do this with the help and the support of the people who are here um, presenting today. But I just wanted to circle back to um, mention some of the other people who help us in, in all of those goals of supporting our students. Ms. Ariel Kramer, who's our Educational Support Services Coordinator, who works with our ESS teachers to provide academic support for our students within the ESS program, um, but is also constantly checking in with students even who aren't under the umbrella of ESS to make sure that every student is getting the academic support that he or she needs. Mr. John L. Hector, who provides one-on-one -on -one academic, uh, social, emotional support, and also partners with me in co-coordinating our advisory program. Rabbi Moshe Groshberg, who is our Mashkiach Ruchani, who oversees our um, Judaic programming outside of the classroom and oversees kind of all of the other spiritual, religious pieces of our school, in turn, including tefillah. And Mrs. Miriam Zaghi, who is our Director of Student Activities, who works very closely with our student council um, in developing programs, overseeing clubs, our chesed hours, our beloved Shabbatonim that we hope to get back to when it is safe to do so. Um, and all of these people really put in their hearts and souls to make sure that our students know that we care about them and we love and support them in and out of the classroom. Before I introduce our student speakers, I just wanted to sort of talk about some next steps that we can take from here. 
Um, our admissions process really works with each and, in, each and every family that is interested in joining uh, the Berman Hebrew Academy Upper School. Um, so we set up individual meetings with you, your student, and, and um, an administrator, either Mrs. Popper or uh, Mrs. Cooper or Rabbi Dr. Kastan. Um, between now and January, our doors are always open. Um, we love to hear from you. We love to meet you. We love to get to know you. Um, we are doing virtual tours. Um, while our students are in the building, we are not able to welcome other adults into the building. So we have a lovely virtual tour that we've created to show you all these spaces and programs that our students take part in. Um, I would be happy to set that time up with you. Um, and we would love to welcome your students virtually to sit in on some classes, to meet some other uh, students that will be in their grade, um, just to see sort of what the students are like in our upper school um, and what the community is and sort of hear from the students themselves uh, what it's like to be a student at Berman. Um, we'll give you a little taste of that now. We invited two student speakers to join us today. Um, I'm actually going to let them introduce themselves. We have Zach Fine, who is a junior, and Dahlia Panich, who is a senior. Um, and I asked them just to share a little bit about their experiences at Berman. Um, and after that, we'll open it up for questions and answers. Um, and we also have a parent on the call, Naomi Carmel, who has two daughters in the upper school. So all of us are here to answer questions. Um, you know, we would love to have just a free-flowing discussion after Zach and Dahlia uh, introduce themselves. Zach, do you want to start? Um, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Zachary Fine. I am a junior. I'm currently the president of the engineering club. Um, one thing I really love about Berman and something that's very different about the upper school is how you're treated like an adult. Um, it's very different than the lower school and middle school in the sense that you're more talked to rather than at. And um, it's much more of a conversation in classes. Um, my favorite class that I've probably taken so far is either molecular biology in freshman year or really um, freshman year uh, double Gemara, honors Gemara. That was a lot of fun. It was my first double period. It was my first time having a class with a different grade. And um, yeah, it was great. Hi, I'm Dolly Pitch and I'm a senior. And I am on the mock trial team and the debate team and a bunch of small clubs at Berman. And my favorite thing about Berman is definitely the warm community that we have. You, no one at Berman ever fails to like feel like they're a part of something. And my favorite class at Berman is AP Bio, as Ms. Popper talked about. Really, a bunch of students came together and were like, we really want an AP Bio class. And they told us if we get, I think it was six kids who wanted to do it, they would make it happen. And we did. And I was so glad that we were able to kind of choose our class in that way. All right, we, we did a lot of talking. Uh, it's time for you, for you to ask questions, um, get to know us, what, what's on your mind? Feel free to unmute. Okay, I will start. <laughs> Hi, Ali, how are you? So uh, my name is Aran Salfati, I'm from Israel, and uh, this is my, my wife, say hello, Batel. Uh, last year we were supposed to come to you uh, to be at this school uh, this year, uh, but uh, because of the COVID uh, we stay uh, in Israel, and uh, we want to ask how you uh, think that next year will be. How maybe you anticipate that uh, you will go back to routine, Ellie? Please okay. come up from. Oops. Sorry. Are, are you asking uh, back to routines from, from the COVID perspective, from everything? No. <laughs> because because I, I, I wish I had the magic eight ball. But can you clarify the question, please? Um, right now, we are uh, studying only with uh, Zoom, like uh, from uh, far, or a student come to the school. Got it. So Mrs. Popper, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Thank you so much. So first of all, I truly hope that by the next school year, we will, the, the world will be in a different place. So from your mouth to Hashem's ears. Um, it, I, I can tell you a little bit about what we're doing and some of the conversations we're having about the next steps. Right now we have um, two grades on campus each week and the other two grades are, are fully virtual and we rotate our students in and out. So we have, um, and part of that is logistically oriented, we need to make sure that we have spaces um, so that everybody is able to follow the health and safety guidelines. And so we, we felt that we could, we have, we have enough room right now for two grades. 
we are in conversation ideally about seeing what would it look like for us to have more grades on campus? What would we need? Do we need to look at other facilities? Do we need to look internally at other places? But right now, because of the way that the numbers are looking, we're not, we're not actually able to, to bring back students more frequently or have more, more students on campus at a given time. But what we do behind the scenes is we do all the preparation so that when the world starts getting into a little bit of a different place, hopefully in a more positive trend, mask up Maryland, um, that we will, we will be able to bring them back and we won't have to waste any time between when our medical task force says it is now safe to assume the next level of risk we have all the plans ready to go. And so that's what we're constantly doing behind the scenes. We're asking the questions of what will it take for us to be able to assume the next level of risk? And what does that look like so that I can work with the team um, you know, with the team in the upper school, with the teachers and the department chairs and Ms. Cooper um, to make sure that we know exactly what that will look like. And then Rabbi Kassan gives us the go ahead and we're ready to go. So that's where we're at and I truly, truly hope um, that soon we'll be able to have more students on campus more frequently because I can tell you that while I was very nervous about what it would look like um, to have everybody back, the joy and the love and the excitement that we have when we're in person with our students is, is really, really tremendous. And so that's our hope, that's our goal, that's our plan, that's where we're heading. Thank and we hope that you'll be able to come. I hope to. Hello. I'm Alexandra Ginsky. I'm in the Chicago area planning a family move yeah, um, to Maryland. I'm wondering, can you talk about how the schedule is structured in the high school level? Do you, is the schedule, I know you're on the block schedule, but somewhat more of an elaboration, is it intermixed or is it something such as all Jewish studies are in the morning, general in the afternoon, or the reverse or by grade level? Sure. So um, great question. Thank you. And let us know if you need any help with your move. Um, I moved with my family across the country a couple of years ago, and so I have a lot of a lot of empathy for 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 the cross country moves. Um, so in our schedule, schedules schedules change from year to year. So I'll tell you a little bit about this schedule, and I will also tell you about some of the things that we're thinking about in terms of next year's iteration of the schedule and some of the factors that go into it. Um, some of it is availability of teachers. Say if you have a teacher who teach two, teaches two courses, they can't teach it at the same time, obviously. Um, ideally, we want we want the classes to be to go from from math to Hebrew language to chumash to science, because we believe that again, as I was saying earlier, that it shouldn't be compartmentalized in, in one half of the day and the other half of the day. There are some times where it's more complicated to design a schedule like that. Um, but, but in our Judaic studies program, our ninth and 10th grade students are in classes together so that we're able to offer more options um, by, having them, by having them join together. And as Zach was saying, in 11th and 12th grade, it's also, they're also combined the grades together. So that's a piece of the schedule. Um, Right now, our class, our academic day is from 8.15 to 4.30. Classes meet for 70 minutes, and then we have an extended passing period, both because of the longer block, but also because our health and safety guidelines require some extra cleaning in between the classes. So we had to expand the passing period this year. So as we look ahead towards next year, some of the questions that we'll be asking um, are, is the length of the period, 70 minutes, the ideal within the block schedule? Should every class be meeting at the same frequency, or as we know, an example is with math. Math benefits from shorter, more frequent meetings. And so as we design the next iteration of the schedule, that's feedback that we're working with. I will tell you that our that that we're we're pacing really well, um, both within the block schedule, but also with our in-person um virtual back and forth hybrid situation. We're doing really well in terms of meeting our curricular goals and objectives this year, while also making sure to invest in the community of our classes as well. Um, and so when we think about the schedule for next year, we hope to be more nuanced about it um, and thinking uh, more carefully about um, the frequency of classes, the length of each class period, how can we design schedules that meet, uh, meet more needs um, based on the feedback that we're seeing and the observations that we're having. Um, and also hopefully we won't have to take into account the, ne you know, the necessity of deep cleaning each space every 70 minutes or so between classes and potting and things like that. So that will impact next year's schedule as well. Yeah, I understand that there's a lot of complexity with 
you know, all the practicalities now. Also, can you mention, you said currently the um, classes are 70 minute blocks. How often do they meet per week or does it depend on subject matter? So right now, um, the this is the first year we transitioned into a block schedule. Um, and so uh, because of a number of factors and some were actually logistically motivated, um, and also in, we all of the classes meet for the, at the same frequency with the exception of our electives, which meet for a shorter amount of time, but, but Monday through Thursday. Um, and so they meet, they meet three times a week. Um, there was a question that I saw that came up in the chat that I can, um, that I can address, which is science and language courses. I'm happy to talk about that for a sec. So all of our students take Hebrew language. Um, we also offer for students that want a second language, American Sign Language, or we offer, um, some of our students have opted actually to take an independent study of another language. We have a student who's so interested in learning Spanish and she's taken it now as an independent study um, in, in, as, as her elective. Um, and in terms of science, so in ninth grade students take biology. We have we have two two different um, two different biology courses. One is a ecological biology, and one is a microbiology. In tenth grade students take chemistry. We have three level, levels of chemistry: the grade level, the plus level, and the honors level. Um, in eleventh grade students take physics. And again, we have um, we have three levels, and many of our students, both in biology and chemistry. Um, uh, are take the subject to the the SAT subject test and in 11th grade in physics they um, students who are interested in taking AP physics while the course the honors level course is not technically an AP class the teacher has um, supplemental work and additional meeting times where she meets with the students who are interested in preparing for the AP as well and in senior year um, if for 12th grade um, we have AP biology um, AP psychology um, I Am I missing anything? What what other classes am I missing? Anatomy AP, and physiology. Thank you. And that, thank you, Dahlia. Anatomy and physiology in AP Physics 2. And then we also offer AP Computer Science, which isn't a hard science, but it, it has the word science in it. Um, so, with, and that's offered, um, we have two different types of, two different AP Computer Science courses that we offer, um, and they're offered every other year. Um, the electives, I'll talk about electives and then I'm gonna hand it over to Ellie to talk about buses if that's okay. Um, so uh, the electives are, um, the electives are actually offered to all of the grades. Um, and so students are able to to it to take, um, let's say, let, let me give you an example with photography. So a student who is interested in photography can choose to take it one of their years of high school, or they can actually go through several years of the program. And their first year, they would take the, the digital photography. Their second year, they would take it on the honors level. And the third, the third year, they would be given the opportunity to submit for the AP. And so the, the different electives that we offer are, um, are um, ceramics, studio art, painting, photography, sports, health, and fitness, um, American Sign Language, AP Computer Science, Engineering, Beat Me Drash, and then students who, who are allowed to take a study hall as their elective during one of the years of, their, of, of a high school. Um, we do offer AP English, both for 11th and 12th grade, and going back to the idea that 9th and 10th grade is about getting the foundation so that the students who want to take AP Lang or AP Lit um, are able to have that foundational knowledge and the, the, the skills of how to write, how to parse a text, the breadth of knowledge and the introduction to different types of texts um, so that they're able to take AP, APs there. And um, if anybody has more specifics about all of our APs or all of our clubs, we're happy to send you all that information in a, in a nice packet so you can just review all of the courses that we offer and all of the options we have available. Um, Ellie, okay, did you... Thank you. I was just like, um, I just wanted to expand on that. I think you probably answered this and I just didn't hear, but is it one elective a year? Oh, thank you. I'm so sorry. I did misunderstand your question. It's one elective a year um, that typically... Um, there are a couple of times where we can make exceptions, but the electives are offered in, in what we call our elective block. Um, some of the electives, we have a Holocaust and human behavior class, which meets at a, at a different time than the elective block. So it's considered an elective. So a student would be able to take, as an example, the Holocaust and human behavior class and ceramics. Um, so so that it, that's the elective. Did that answer your question better? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks for asking it again. Okay, Ellie, you wanna talk about buses? 
Yeah. Um, so we have a few different bus options. We run buses in both the morning and the afternoon at 3.30 and at 4.30. So our upper school students have um, a time to get home on the bus. Um, we offer busing to Kent Mill, Potomac and Shepherd Park in the morning and afternoon. If we have enough ridership for another line, so if we have about six students, um, we're happy to open up more busing. Um, but right now those are our three main bus routes. And we offer um, a bus from Baltimore um, that just runs at the fourth, like in the morning and at 4.30. Um, two other questions I wanna answer. The length of the school day is we start with to be live every day at 8.15 and the school day ends this year at 4.30. That was a change last year. We ended at five and we, we end at 4.30 this year. Um, in terms of college recruitment and open house events, um, absolutely. Um, we have a, and even now, just so you know, I, I, I Dolly, maybe because she can share her senior calendar of all of the all of the colleges, universities, yeshiva, seminaries, Israel programs that are coming. Um, and they come, they run open houses. We we work with all of our college reps very, very closely to make sure that they they're not actually conflicting with each other. So we so that our students are able to go to which have a lot of options of where they want to go. Um, we also um for students that want to go and arrange college tours again in a year where that would be available to them, we we help facilitate those and they and we we really work hard. And what we know about the college admissions process is that especially in some more competitive places and universities, that the relationship that is established between our students and the college rep is is a critical relationship that actually could tip the scale in one way or the other. Many of our students, um, uh, all of our students have the scores and have the transcripts and have the extracurriculars. And so how do you differentiate yourself? Part of that is in the essay that you write. Part of that is in making sure you have solid recommendations. And another way that we know to be true is in those relationships. So we look to foster those relationships, create space for those relationships, encourage those relationships um, and, uh, so that so that our students are able to, to be more successful in that way. Um, I think I've caught the questions in that are in the chat. If anybody has other questions, feel free to ask away. I'm a teacher by, by trade, and so I'm really good with wait time. Doesn't make me feel awkward, but, but Ellie, you want to take it away? I have, a, I have another question, if that's okay. Go ahead. Um, how are you doing like sports teams now because of COVID? Great question. So um, we are running sports clinics by pod. So in, in Berman, um, different diff, in the upper school, we've potted a grade. Um, in the other divisions, they pot a little bit differently. And so what we've offered is if a, if a group of students within a grade are interested, and they, again, they have a minimum number, but it's the idea is that we want to make it available to them, then we're able to run sports clinic with our coaches. Our league is not right now moving forward with team sports, so we're not able to do it this year, um, at least through the winter sports, potentially, you know, potentially, we'll see what happens with spring. Um, but in a typical year, we have everything from baseball to track and field to cross country to basketball varsity, junior varsity, soccer varsity, junior varsity, um, football, um, lots, lots and lots of options. Go ahead, Ellie. Tennis. <laughs> We're in tennis. We recently refurbished our tennis courts and are hoping someone in this audience might be a superstar tennis player and would love to join our, our tennis team. Very true. Rachel, go ahead. Um, hi. I was wondering, what is the difference between the girls and boys offerings when it comes to Limude Kodesh? Is it all separate? And also in particular, um, is there a difference in expectations of the boys and the girls and levels? Great question. So the as I mentioned earlier, our ninth and 10th grade and our 11th and 12th grade comes together for, for Judaic studies. We have three levels, but we do separate boys and girls for Judaic studies. So the girls will have three levels of Chumash as an example, and the boys will have three levels of Chumash. Um, in terms of the in terms of the curriculum, the curricula are identical. 
Um, we, we know about curriculum is that it's not just about what you teach, but how you teach it. And each, each teacher sort of brings their own, their own personality into the teaching and learning. And we celebrate that and honor that because um, you can be handed a great curriculum and, and what you do with it is what matters. Um, but in terms of the core content and the core curriculum, it's, it's the same. There are a couple of dis distinctions between um, the boys and the girls in terms of, in terms of, of the offerings. And that is specific specifically in 11th and 12th grade, the Tom was on, Tom would honor course is a double period for the boys and a single period for the girls. Um, and that's really the main distinction between the program. And I would say that if, if the, should, should the group of girls want to have the double period, um, we would, we would work hard to make that, to make that available to them. One of the things that Rabbi Kassan and Ms. Cooper and I are constantly talking about is ways to expand our offerings in terms of our Judaic program. So we have a we have a we have a typical and a traditional program that that our students are able to engage in. We teach Chumash, we teach Navi, we teach we teach Gemara, we have Ivrit, but we're also looking to to create space for Jewish philosophy in a more structured and a more formal way. We're looking to create different options and opportunities as well. And so we we're 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 actively engaged with our Judaic studies team. Um, in these discussions to expand our offerings across the board. And, and to, to say yes and to that, that um, there is the Kolo and Midrashah, right? So Ms. Papa was pointing out that there's one distinction in the honors level. And really that was due to interest, not, not due to philosophy um, at the honors level in terms of, um, you know, the, the, there was an interest for the boys to have it as a double period. Um, but we do have the Kolo and Midrashah in 11th and 12th grade, which are both a double period for boys and for girls. And those are identical as well. Um, so everything that Mrs. Popper just said is uh, always with an eye towards equity and learning for boys and for girls in terms of the content, but also in terms of ex expectations. Can you just elaborate on the teachers for, for, for each of the curriculum for the boys and girls? Is it the same teachers who are teaching both um, just in terms of like the, the education and who's actually teaching the classes? Sure. I, I'm gonna, I think I understand your question. Um, so I'm gonna try, but if I don't get it, if I don't fully answer your question, feel free to re-ask it. Um, are we, a lot of the, a lot of the things that drive who's teaching what often is impacted by schedules. Um, and so it's whenever possible, teachers will teach the same courses um, to the boys and to the girls, but from a scheduling perspective, it's not always possible. So that it, it's not because um, the person who's teaching Chumash honors 11, 12 is not interested or able to teach Chumash honors 11, 12 boys, but, but rather it's much more practically motivated. And so um, when we're thinking, so do you, did you want me to talk like specifically about who's teaching what or more just like, is it an intentional thing? Intentionality and also, do you have any faculty who will not teach girls classes? So do you have any faculty that, that, that will only teach boys or do you have all faculty that will teach both genders? We, all of our faculty members teach both genders. We, the, the, the only time that it really comes up is in, is in terms of Gemara. Um, and certain faculty members and sort of where they are, where they are in terms of that. Um, but again, a lot of what, a lot of what happens is teachers, one of, let me take, let me start again. One of the interesting things about our Judaic cities teachers and Judaic cities program across the country is that you're hired to be a Judaic studies teacher. And that means you teach Gemara, you teach Chumash, you teach Navi, you teach whatever it is that you're, that you're gonna do and, and the prep may be different from year to year. And so when we're thinking about how to set our teachers up for success and therefore by extent, the learning to be at the level that we want it to be at and the, and the ability for, for that, that classroom community to be developed, we do think very carefully about who is teaching what, is this a new prep for them? Is this something that they've taught a few times already and they are really familiar with so they don't have to spend the time learning the basic curriculum, but rather they can think about how to engage their students and meet the needs. And so when we think about designing schedules for that, um, that, that is in the best interest of teaching and learning, we think very, very carefully about who is teaching what how many preps they have so that we can make sure that what happens in the classroom is at the level and at the quality and has those essential questions and enduring understandings that we're looking for within our curriculum. 
If I could just add to that, um, I think that more than half of the Judaics classes that I've taken so far in high school have actually had the same teacher teaching the same level for the boys and the girls classes. And like, as a girl at Berman, I never really feel that the boys are getting like a different education than us in Judaics. And like, that's never really been a problem for me. And I haven't heard that concern voice throughout the girls in the high school. Thanks, Dahlia. This may be more for Dahlia and Zach than anyone else, but I'd appreciate anybody weighing in. I think wondering, you know, hearing all of this, I'm wondering what the messaging from the school to the students is about why the classes are separate for Limu J Kodesh and not for science or math or something else. I mean, for me personally, I am really happy that the classes are separate for Limu J Kodesh because I, I think it like, facilitates a more serious learning environment. I don't know what like the intention necessarily was behind it. But for me, I feel that people feel more comfortable to kind of ask any questions that they have or be more serious or share personal things. Like for example, in my Chumash class on Fridays, my teacher likes to really share things that have like inspired us this week. And I think that people get really personal and sometimes they feel more comfortable with just their gender in the classes. So I really like that the classes are separate, but I don't know if that's that's just how I feel. I don't know about Zach, he can add. Yeah, I was about to say the same thing that it's really, there's not that much difference between the courses more that you're just more comfortable. I mean, it's to the degree that I've studied with girls who are taking the parallel course with me for the same test that we have the next day. It's really all the same. It's really just about comfort. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm going to answer two, two questions in the chat. So there is a theater program. This year, the theater program is on pause because of COVID. Um, but we have, as Ms. Cooper was talking a little bit earlier, we have the Hadass program um, where we um, we have a we have a director um, and they they put on they put on usually a winter winter and a spring, sometimes just one performance. Um, we also we also have an acapella group sometimes that, that depending on interest of the students. And I would go back to say that one of the things that we're really proud of is finding space to nurture the individual creativity of our students. And for some, for some students, it's in mock trial or debate or model UN. And for other students, it's in the arts and creativity. Um, and so we wanna create spaces for all of our students to be able to exercise their individuality. Um, there are, uh, be, in our block schedule, there are four periods plus, uh, plus the elective that meet every day. Um, a student typically takes um, four Judaic studies, including Hebrew language, um, and five general studies, um, it, it, including the elective. So they are registered in nine classes, um, Chumash, Navi, Gemara, um, Hebrew language, a science, math, history, and English. Um, we do have some students that have come in from public school. We have a, a we, depending on where, where they are in terms of their Judaic studies background, sometimes they're able to matriculate into our program fully. Sometimes we look to provide some support in certain areas so that we can make sure that they have the foundation. Um, we, we have the opportunity sometimes to partner with our sister school, Sulam, in terms of they have an OPAN course to give, um, to provide a Hebrew language background for students that need a much more individualized program. Um, we sometimes partner and, and recommend some out time, outside tutoring or support um, over the summer and at the beginning of the year in order to help those students gain some of that foundational knowledge um, that they may not have had in a, in a, in a traditional um, day school setting before high school. Um, but we definitely have um, a, a couple of students who have come in from public school that I'm thinking of right now and are, are not quite successful. Um, <clears throat> I want to be mindful of our time. It is 1115. Um, I know it's Sunday and it's not raining. So people may want to uh, take the opportunity to ride, um, and uh, take care of their, some of their Sunday activities. Um, I would like to invite all of you to follow up. Um, all of us can be reached by, via email. I'm happy to set up some time for you to speak with our administrators, for your students to come and visit our classes, get to know some of our upper school students. Um, I want to thank everyone for their time this morning. We have really enjoyed the conversation and getting to hear what's getting uh, to know you and what's important to you as you look for a high school. Um, and I hope that we can have some good follow-up conversation soon.
So thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a great Sunday. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Have a great day.